How is the university today? The university is a place to study, a place to explore different fields, different areas, but it's also a place of, for us, our mission field. And uh, we'll speak about the university, and I would like to invite Ross McKenzie to come forward, and he will tell us about the university today. So, first of all, if you want the professorial version of this talk with all the footnotes, go to the Word and World booth, and there's a article um, in this great issue. You can also get it online. So first, I will tell a little of my story. So when I was an undergraduate student in Australia, I started following Jesus seriously. Now, my IFES involvement began in the USA, and while I was in an intervarsity Christian Fellowship Group for graduate students, I met my wife, Robin, who is also here. And that group was led by Dave and Sally Ivaska and Kathy Twan, who's also here. So we are very much an IFES family. Both my two children, Luke and Michelle, they benefited immensely from being involved in the Australian Fellowship of Evangelical Students. So I've been blessed recently by IFES from being involved in engaging the university initiative and particularly this Big Issues project. IFES has helped me see and understand more profoundly how I am part of God's story. But how do universities fit into God's story? Well, Colossians tells us that the Son is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation, for in him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible. Whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he's the head of the body, the church. He's the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead, so that in everything he might have supremacy. For God was to please have all his fullness dwell in him, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. So God has a purpose for all creation. God has a purpose for all human institutions, including universities. However, rebellious humanity has a different purpose. And we see this rebellion in universities today. Too often they're filled with pride, selfish ambition, greed, injustice, and conflicts. Students, faculty, administrators, governments, and businesses want to use universities for their own personal gain, whether it's for money, for power, for sex, or social status. Now, in your university, many of you will have experienced hostility to the gospel, whether from students, teachers, researchers, or administrators. Some claim the gospel is irrelevant. Science has all the answers. The gospel's not intellectually respectable. The ultimate realities are material, economic, and political. Secularism and pluralism 
mean the gospel of Jesus has no place in the university, except perhaps in a multi-faith chaplaincy building on the edge of campus. Now, most universities today are dominated by the values of economic neoliberalism. In this view, universities are essentially a business. Students are customers, and teachers and researchers are entrepreneurs. Education is reduced to students obtaining accreditation that will lead to a job that will increase their wealth, power, and social status. And the purpose of research is to produce knowledge that is commercially valuable and to provide income to the university through overheads and to increase the global ranking of the university. Now, this in turn will attract more international students who will pay high tuition fees. The dominant four values of the neoliberal university are money, metrics, marketing, and management. Transcendent values such as virtue, curiosity, scholarship, character development, and collegiality are considered irrelevant or unrealistically idealistic. I despair. And given the hostility to the gospel and the absence of Christian values, it is easy to despair. Is God's purpose being thwarted? But there is another story, and there is a different vision vision for universities than that of rebellious humanity. And this is a much older story and involves a much richer vision. And this is God's story. God does use universities for the glory of Christ. Students come to faith in Christ, are discipled, and as graduates impact the church and society. But where did universities come from? They largely came from the church and were centered on the Bible and a biblical worldview. According to the definitive history of universities in Europe, medieval universities were characterized by seven central values. And it's striking how they were all deeply rooted in Christian theology. And here are four of them. God is the creator of an ordered world accessible to human reason. Human imperfection. And this impelled intellectual criticism and collegial cooperation. Humanity is made in the image of God, and this led to academic freedom. Scientific and scholarly knowledge is a public good transcending any economic benefit it might bring. Now, these values were further sharpened by the Protestant Reformation and were key drivers in the development of modern science. And this has been chronicled in two influential books by my colleague, Professor Peter Harrison, a historian. Now, we do seem to be a long way from this past. Is the situation hopeless? No, because we have hope in the truth of Colossians, that Jesus is supreme over all things and will reconcile all things to himself. And I'll share a few things that, practical things that will increase my hope. Because Daniel, who we honor this evening, has said, we should have a discipleship of the mind. The calling for this ministry of IFES is in the university 
and not a primary school. It is the place that engages the mind. That is why engaging university cannot happen if we do not take seriously the discipleship of the mind. This is our ministry field. This is where God has put us. Now, the majority of professors in global universities are not Christian. Some are hostile. However, there is a significant minority who are Christian, who are public about their faith, and do think deeply about the relationship between their academic discipline and theology. And some are leaders in their academic field and write books such as these, published by Cambridge and Oxford University Press. Now, 40 years ago, when I started as a student at university, there were very few university teachers and researchers like this. There were some, but very few and far less than today. And so things are in Kate changing, and this is quite encouraging and exciting. Now, engaging the university means joining conversations already happening on campus. And these conversations can go two ways. Our theology can be challenged, sharpened and strengthened by the issues and questions we encounter. And at the same time, we can bring Christian insight and activism to those issues and questions. And this aligns with the discussions of dialogue and double listening advocated by John Stott and Chris Wright. Our apologetics can be enhanced by a critical and constructive engagement with philosophy and discoveries in the natural sciences. Anthropology and sociology can help us in cross-cultural ministry and evangelism. And working for social justice may be aided by knowing more about law, economics, and sociology. Now, the Society of Christian Scholars was recently launched by Global Scholars. It brings together Christian academics in secular universities around the world to network, mentor, meet, and share resources. And GBU in uh, Francophone Africa has been quite influential in shaping this society. And the society provided scholarships for some of the participants at the African Scholars Track at this World Assembly. And so I want to encourage you to find Christian professors you know to join and participate in this society. But I also want to encourage all of you to have confidence in the gospel. Don't be intimidated by intellectuals. The gospel is relevant. Science does not have all the answers. The gospel is intellectually respectable. Genuine secularism and pure pluralism means that the gospel has a place in conversations on campus. And neoliberalism is an impoverished vision for the university. A Christian theological vision is the richest vision. Now, too often, I despair about universities today. But another reason I have hope is because of some of the exceptional IFES students and graduates that I meet. And so I want to introduce two African students who are great messengers of hope. Ibuku is from Nigeria and currently doing a PhD in counseling psychology in Canada. And then we'll change to French and Yakuba from Niger um, will, will speak, and he's currently doing a medical residency in Cote d'Ivoire.
Good evening, everyone. I have a question for you. Have you ever thought that you knew everything about life, but then realized that God is infinite in wisdom? <laughs> well, that was me. And these verses have changed my mindset. I want to share them with you today and my story as well. Job 32, verse 7 says, I said, days should speak, and multitude of years should teach wisdom. Isn't that the mindset of many of us students today? We think the numbers of years we spend in university and work and lots of experience from people who have gone ahead of us will give us enough wisdom to live our lives. But I want to tell you that Job 32 explains to us that we could be wrong about this. The verses 8 and 9 say, But there is a spirit in man, and the inspiration of the Almighty giveth them understanding. Great men are not always wise, neither do the aged understand judgment. God saved me at a very young age in Nigeria, and all I wanted to do was to share the good news of hope to anybody in need. But I didn't know how. Guess what? Jesus knew how. And from my high school days, he arranged it such that people were drawn to me for advice. I always pointed them to follow Jesus genuinely, and they found solutions to their problems. Moving on, God gave me the opportunity to go to university in Canada. And I thought, huh, I could study psychology because it's the field that would teach me to give the best advice. Or so I thought. In my fourth year, a professor said, psychologists are not to give advice in therapy sessions. <laughs> These words sent me into a crisis in my career. What was I doing in psychology if I couldn't give advice? <laughs> I had to pray and ask God for guidance. And he inspired me to stay in psychology, but specialize in counseling psychology, where I have the privilege to walk alongside people as they go through different life challenges. This, to me, was a higher call to be more involved in people's lives. I wouldn't go into the miracle of how he provided me a scholarship and admission for my master's and PhD in Canada at McGill, but I want to assure you that God does not call the qualified. He qualifies who he calls. Postgraduate studies has been a mission field for me, and my vision has been always to share this gospel of hope to every single one I meet on campus. What's more, the Graduate Christian Fellowship at InterVarsity has been the platform to fulfill that mission. God has allowed me to enter many challenging situations, but has kept my faith and strengthened me. But I want to thank every single person around the globe that has raised me up and people like me, Christians in academia, and have prayed for us because I wouldn't have been here without them. God inspired me to reject sinful actions in my therapy training. He gave me the wisdom to express positive attitudes when we were reading 400 pages and assignments throughout the week. He taught me how to be hospitable to schoolmates. And one of my schoolmates in my room, in my house one day, just broke down in tears and said, I feel the love of God in your home. So when people ask me, how are you going to get through the remaining five years of PhD? I smile and I tell them that God's grace is sufficient for me. The grace of God colors my effort and covers my errors. And through the grace of God, I am ready to go through any hardship just to see graduate students come and follow Jesus. I started off not knowing how to share this gospel of hope. But now, 
I'm just relying on the infinite wisdom of God to do it. And I invite you all to continue this journey and you see what Jesus can do in all your universities as you share the hope that God gave you when you met him at first. Thank you. Bonsoir, l'Assemblée. Dear friends, it is a great joy and also a lot of emotion that I'm speaking in front of you to share a little bit of what the Lord has been doing for me within the GBU. As Professor Ross introduced me, I'm a medical doctor. I did my specializing in internal medicine in Ivory Coast, Abidjan. I am married to my wife, Halimatu is here. We have a daughter, four years old daughter. And I'm from Niger, a vast country, which is almost a desert, with more than 95% of Muslim population. I was born in a Christian family, and I became a Christian in 2001. At the time, I was facing lots of questions fired at me by my classmates. I found Christ in the scriptures, especially in chapter 14 of John's Gospel, and this changed my life forever. I arrived to university in 2005 to study medicine. I discovered the local student group, also through the elders in my church, who are in the departments of the same university. I started attending the Bible studies and the meetings, but since there was no group in the department of medicine, the Lord uh, helped us to come start a small group that became bigger and bigger. There were very intense moments, very emotional as well, through scripture engagement. Usually, we would finish the meeting with people confessing and people deciding to become Christians to the glory of Christ. We were nicknaming this group the School of Theology. This is where I learned a lot about leadership and my vision about the church has been changed massively. After graduating, the health department of my church, the National Church in Capital City, Niamey, asked me to direct an experimental clinic, Clinic Olivia in Niamey, that we just had started in the capital city, Niamey. We were so blessed by the impact in the community, which was so strong that this same community stood up in 2015 to defend the clinic against the demonstrators. Four times in a row in 2015 because the population of the neighborhood protected our clinic because this was in their own interest. People were demonstrating to protest against the president taking part to the March for Freedom of Expression in Paris following the attack on the satirical journal Charlie Hebdo. I also note that more than 60 places of worship have been burned down by demonstrators. Another experience which is major in my leadership within the GBU Niger happened as we were organizing the first national congress in 2016, an historical event. The coordinator of the um, development department of our church, whom I'm naming here, Dr. Shako Sheriff, was a former minister of the Republic, an economist at the Department of Economy. He heard about our challenges to found rates for this national event. As he heard that we were struggling, he took that at heart. And since he was impacted by my own leadership in that clinic, as he later said, so his help helped cover all the food and shelter cost for the whole Congress. Glory to God.
Je suis impliqué dans I'm le also involved avec in the committee in engaging with the University of Francophone IFIS Africa Groups, Quand le secrétaire régional as invité asked by the regional secretary in 2016 to invited me to the first meeting of French faculty. I'm passionate très about très science. I was very moved to see mindful academics, respected and respectable, who were Seigneur committed to the Lord and committed time to this movement. This deeply Ma impacted me. Je suis très fier de I'm very en proud of serving as the head of communication for this coordination committee. Conviction is that science is one of the means that God gave us to reveal Himself to humanity. Now I'm continuing my studies. Later I will go back to Niger through the grace of God because the, the needs are huge in that country. We are less than 2,000 medical doctors for roughly 20 million inhabitants. The perspective, I hope to integrate the joint medical staff of the Department of Medical and I hope to uh, use my gifts through uh, research and health services in my country. Thank you.